I guess, so, folks, the question of the hour today around the world is the question, where is God in all of this? I bet the skeptics and the cynics are kind of having a field day right now and uh, all asking the question, where would God be at a time like this? The skeptics and the cynics would suggest that if there is a God, that He's distant and it is far off. And, and the question would be, why is if He is God, has He allowed this stuff to happen to us? And so... That would be their, their response of the question, where is God right now? But for us, as saints of God, as Christians, as believers, as disciples of Jesus, we're asking different questions, completely different questions. We're asking God, what should we pray in light of this virus? What would you want for our role to be in the light of this pandemic that is before us? What is the purpose of the church here on earth at a time like this? We know, Lord, that your will will ultimately be done, but, but we're praying too, God, that if this is not to be taken from us, that we would find our purpose in all of this. So I suppose that there are a bunch of churches, in fact, tons of churches out there today, seeking to answer the question, where is God at a time like this? Does He care? Why did He do it? If so, what is the purpose of all this? What should our role, what should our response be? How should we pray? I bet there are tons of churches preaching that kind of stuff today. Well, I'm going to join my sermon with all of them. I want to take you to an Old Testament prophet uh, answering the question, where is God? And we have the, the prophet Ezekiel talking about this and answering this very question. And I hope that the prophet will speak into our lives with passion and with purpose and with real meaning today. Jehovah Shema is the name God is there. And this was a phrase coined by, by the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 48 verse 35. And it's his last thoughts, it's his last statement at the end of a very long prophetic life. And his question is, in light of everything that I have been through, and everything that has happened, in light of my faithfulness to prophesy to these people who just won't listen, where is God? And he points us in the last sentence of his prophecy to Jehovah Shema. God is there. But before we get to there, we need to do a little bit of a background thing. First of all, if we're asking where God is, let's try and find out, first of all, where God is not. There are places where God most definitely is not. I want to suggest to you, first of all, that these places might sound a little strange, but I want to rush through them because I think they're important. The first place where God is not is in the place of the, number one, the satisfied soul. I remember meeting a guy once, came from overseas, very affluent man, came from a very affluent country, and he had come and he was looking at our project of Genesis and, and he made a comment. He said, wow, he said, you know, in Africa, God is big. You know, God is big because we kept telling Him that we're doing all these things and loving our community because God loves them. And that is a concern to us that we should do the same. And with a confused look on his face, this man said, wow, God is big in Africa. But, but where I come from, God is not so big. You see, in Africa, you need God. Where I come from, we don't need God. You see, he had very silly recognized that God, or for him, he had sort of thought that God was only there to meet his physical needs. And he thought that as long as I have my physical needs, then I have no need of, of God. How sad is that? His soul was completely satisfied with everything that he had, with his retirement plan, with his lovely house, with the medical aid scheme. He was totally satisfied. And we look at this and we see that Jesus spoke of a man like this once, where Jesus spoke of the prosperous fool who'd had a great harvest. And he went out there to reap his harvest, build bigger barns, put his harvest in. And he did the same kind of thing. He said, you know, I will now eat, drink, and be merry. I will satisfy my soul, and my soul is now satisfied. Let me just eat. Let me just drink, and let me be merry. People, God is not found at the place of the satisfied soul. The second place where God is not found is at the place of the saturated soul soul. This is the soul of the guy who's, who typically we could look at the innkeeper in the Christmas story. The innkeeper was saturated with people. He didn't know what to do with them all. It was a time of incredible busyness. It was like, 
like there were thousands of people, and then Mary arrives, and he says, Mary, I have no room for you. My place is saturated. There was no room for Jesus in the end. I remember hearing the story, the beautiful little anecdote of a, of a kid who's sitting in the front row at the Christmas story, and a Christmas pageant is happening up on the stage, and, and he hears the line from the innkeeper, there is no room for him in the end. And this little guy jumps and says, hey, but you can come to my house. And uh, I thought, what a beautiful picture of, of the spontaneity of the kid saying, hey, if there's no room for Jesus there, my home can take you. People, our lives are so busy. Our lives are so focused on so many different things. Our lives are, are so frustrated by the cares and the burdens of this life. And our souls have become saturated. There is no place for God in a saturated soul. The next place where there is no place for God is what I have called the set soul. This is the set in concrete guy. He's got the hardened like concrete heart. And his heart has become so hardened towards the things of God. He's angry with God over this and he's angry with God over that and he's disappointed with God over this. And eventually he says, if there is a God, I don't know where he is. And, and his heart has become hardened. But I have to tell you, as much as it would sound like this is the worst kind of soul to have, is the hardened, set soul. I read in the scripture and I find that God is able to, to take a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Hardened hearts are not a problem to God. If there ever was a man with a set soul or a hard heart, it would have had to be the, the, the man, King Saul, the king, not King Saul, the Saul of Tarsus, he was a man well-educated, well-versed in the Bible of as it was in those times. And he had heard the scriptures, he knew them. And yet his heart was so hardened against people of faith, he was so hardened that he couldn't accept the fact that Jesus was who he claimed to be. He persecuted Christians, he put them into jail. He showed the life of a man with a hardened heart and a very set soul. It wasn't a problem to God though. God came and did a supernatural act of a transplant for him. In one minute, his heart was taken, torn out, and God gave to that man, Saul, Paul, the most incredibly gentle, gracious, and wonderfully soft heart. So the hardened soul is not a problem to God. There is another soul that is a problem, and that is the problem of the desanitized soul. And we've been doing a, a lot of sanitizing lately, and uh, my hands are, uh, are tired of being washed. The desanitized soul is a soul that it can thinks that can continue to live in sin, and that God will just accept me for who I am and the sin that I stand for. I don't want to sanitize my soul because I enjoy my sin. I don't want to have a clean heart before God because then I cannot do the things that I sometimes love, albeit in the darkness, do those things. There is no place for God in a desanitized heart. But the biggest one, as per the prophet, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, is what I've called the desensitized soul. This is the soul of the people to whom Ezekiel we're talking to. Ezekiel and Ezekiel had been tasked to, to speak into the nation. He came as a prophet and his message was not uncommon. His message was simply to the nation. Hey guys, God is holy. Don't mess with the holy God. Sin is a problem. Deal with your sin. And those were very often the messages that came from the prophets of the time. God is holy. Sin is a problem. But he always, every prophet, I think except one, spoke about the hope that if you return to God, if you repent of your sin, that God has a great future for you. And they always left with a, with a sense of hope. But this message of Ezekiel goes even a step further. And he closes his prophecy by talking about a city. We will look at that as being like Jerusalem in that context, the new Jerusalem in ours. And he's pointing the people to eternity, to a city that would not be made necessarily by hand as their one would be, but a, a city that would be made of God, that place that is prepared for us that Jesus spoke about. 
In chapter 10 of this amazing prophecy, there's kind of like a turning point. Ezekiel has been prophesying holiness, and sin is a problem to these people over and over again. But as much as they have heard those messages so many, so many times, they continue just to rebuff God, rebuff the words of Ezekiel. And then a very tragic thing happens in chapter 10. The focus of his prophecy turns his eyes towards the temple, which was the center of worship for the Jewish people. And he spoke about the glory of God in the temple. And the glory of God was the reason that the temple was there. And he speaks about the glory of God. And then he says this. And you can sense God doing this with a deep sense of, of, of sadness. And, and, and he's been rejected again. And he says this in his prophecy. That the four cherubim that are heavenly beings rose up from in the temple and they hovered above the temple. And then the glory of God came out above the cherubim. And God left the temple that day. The glory of the Lord left the temple. God has left the building. See, their hearts have become so, so hardened. Their hearts have become so desensitized kind of like calluses on your hand if you work with your hands. Your hands can become desensitized because of the nature of physical work. You don't feel things anymore. And that was the state of these people that Ezekiel was prophesying to. Let me just read to you this passage and you'll see what I'm saying. In chapter 2, this is what God said. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I'm sending you are obstinate and stubborn. And they are, you know, they're kind of like this whole thing about their heart has become so desensitized that they're hardened and they are stubborn. The people to whom I'm sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And then we read in chapter 10 how the presence of God left the temple. God will not find a place amongst the desanitized souls of the world or the desensitized souls of the world. So the question must be, therefore, where is God? Let's go here. God is... Uh, where he, he, where he appears to be, but is not. You see, there are places that would have looked like maybe God is there, but actually, in fact, God is not there. Let me take you to a couple of these places very quickly. The first place where God appears to be, but is not, is in the place of dry religion. This is the place of... of uh, of empty traditions going through the same motion over and over and over again saying the right words but your heart has become desensitized to the things of God and they are just ritualistic in their way and some people will get it and say I own this and I love this they're saying the same words but they're doing it with a completely different heart but some people are doing this with a desensitized heart and a heart that is is a place where God is not, and it's just routine, and it's ritual, and in a sense, even it might be rebellious. Again, the prophet Ezekiel helps us with this. In Ezekiel chapter 37, he speaks about a valley. The valley is full of dry bones. And he talks about this valley, and he says that God says to Ezekiel, what do you see? And Ezekiel says, God, I see a valley. It's full of dry bones. And so God says to him, well, prophesy to the bones. Just preach to the bones. Ezekiel obeys. And to his amazement, all of a sudden, the bones begin to join together. And it's not long before the, the bones have come together and he's got skeletons lying on the floor and he stands amazed. God says, keep preaching and watch what happens. All of a sudden, to those bones are joined sinews and to those sinews are joined meat. And eventually, he's got these carcasses and these meat things lying on the floor there. He says, keep preaching, Ezekiel, keep preaching. And eventually his skin comes to the bone, hair grows. And before him lies a valley of no longer dry bones, but of dead bodies. 
And he says, Ezekiel, what do you see? He says, God, I see thousands of just dead bodies, but they're dead. They're of no use to anybody. They're of no use to you or to anybody else because they are dead. And God says, Ezekiel, keep prophesying. And then God breathes his life into those once dead bodies. And it's beautiful because it says that a mighty army stood up in that valley. You know, people, I love the church. I love the church. But man, I'm so scared of church full of warm bodies where there is no breath of God. I'm so nervous of finding a church where we go through the routines and the rituals and we go through the moments and we preach the sermons and we sing the songs and we pray the prayers. All of those are to the plus side of the ledger. But, but I have to tell you, people, I'm so nervous of the fact that God may have left the house. You see, sometimes we get so good at doing church that we don't even need God anymore to do it. We can go through the routines and sing that, do the whole caboodle, and we can have the party, and God may well have left us. There was no breath in us. So when we talk about this, we talk about it, we cry out to God that His Holy Spirit would breathe that life into these bodies, because that makes a difference. The secret is in the breath. In John chapter 2, he has an interesting idea. In John chapter 2, we have Jesus about to perform his first miracle in, in Cana of Galilee. And Jesus is at this wedding, and uh, the wedding has happened, and everybody's having the party. And then disaster struck because they found out that they had run out of wine. And wine is in the scriptures significant of life, and in many places significant of the beauty and the joy and the spontaneity and the life that comes through the Holy Spirit. And they, and they had the party, but they ran out of wine. I'm going to tell you people, I'm so nervous of a church that is a party, but no wine. And we can have the party, but we don't always have the wine, because the wine is that which only God can bring, which only Jesus can do. And when we have the wine of the Spirit of God, He's not going to put His wine in old wine vessels. He's going to put them in new ones. And we need to be ready to receive the wine of the Holy Spirit for this generation and for our church. You see people here again, we can have the party. We can go through the things, we can sing the songs, we can play the music. But if the wine <laughs> is not there, man, the party will never be what it means to be. You can have the party, but you don't always have the wine. Secondly, where is God? He's not in the place of dry, it appears to be that he might be in the place of dry religious living. But he's certainly not at the place of blind presumption. Blind presumption. Oh, we've got stories, have we not? About how God has been with us in the past. We love to tell those stories. And yet sometimes those stories get a, become an end in themselves and there's nothing for the future because we're so busy reflecting on the past. And when we move into the future, we automatically assume and then presume that God is going to do for us in the future what He's done for us in the past. Well, that may or that may not necessarily be true. As I read in the Scripture, particularly in the Old Testament, I see Joshua after that incredible victory at Jericho. Man, bringing the walls down, wiping out the city, and doing everything in the great celebration of God's purpose having been fulfilled and God's word having come true. And then there's another little town, a tiny little town called Ai, close by. And that's the next town that they have to take. And so we read how Joshua just said, oh, guys, it's just a small town. Go out there with just a few soldiers and, and just take the town. Man, they blindly presume that the God who was with them yesterday will be the God who's going to go with them today. And they found that that wasn't true. You see, because of the sin in the camp of Joshua's people, God had withdrawn his presence from them, and they went with blind presumption, and as a result, they faced the consequence of a terrible defeat. And then you read in Judges chapter 16, and you read of a, of a man, his name was Samson, so much strength and so much possibility and so much potential. And you read how the Spirit of God was given to him to fulfill the purpose of God. But Samson 
messed up so badly. He got a girlfriend called Delilah who nagged him to death and said, Samson, why are you so strong? And then, then you know the story well. She, he said to her jokingly, well, if you, if you take seven thongs and run me with them when I'm asleep, I'll be as weak as any other man. They did that. And when they woke him and the Philistines were there, we read how he broke the thongs and he, he beat up the Philistines. He did it again. They said, if you, if you wind me with seven ropes, new ropes, if you, if you weave my hair into seven braids, then I will be as weak as any other man. But every time he came out of that, he was, still had his strength with him and God was still with him. Until the last one where you know the story and he told her, cut my hair. And Samson lost his strength and he woke up and was taken over by the Philistines. He was put into prison. They took out his eyes and now he's blind. Blind presumption. He just presumed that the God who was with him before is going to be the same God who's going to help him now. And his blind presumption led in his case to a physical blindness. And this was an incredibly terrible thing. But in verse 20 of chapter 16 of the book of Judges, we read some of the most tragic words ever written. It says this of Samson, that he did not realize that God had left him. Tragic words. Let's move on. Where is God? Where he appears not to be, but is. Where he appears not to be, but is. I have one sort of thought for you over here. Is that in light of God appearing in places where ordinarily he should not be, I have an incredible understanding as I read scripture of God turning up in the most unexpected places. The very places we think that God would never be are the places God comes to. The very places we think God will never be in that, and we find out that God is in that. We have the story of the 12 disciples in the storm, that in a place where God ordinarily didn't look like He was there. In fact, He was there. We have the story of those three kids standing in the fire. It looked like they were dead, and they were going to be tossed. And God was found in the fire with them. It didn't look like God should be there, but God was there in the fire with them. We have the men on the walk to Emmaus after the crucifixion of Jesus. And they're just, they're just bemoaning their faith. That where is God? He's there. Where is Jesus? He's, He's now dead. Until they find out very unexpectedly that Jesus was with them. We find this woman at the well. And we see how she was talking with Jesus. Jesus turned up in the most unexpected places. At a well talking to a sinful, messed up lady. We find Jesus hanging out with the poor and the rejected and the downtrodden. And the marginalized. We find Jesus in places where people would not ordinarily find him to be. People, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. But the question that we have to ask today is, where's Jesus in the coronavirus? Where is he? Is he distant from us? Did this happen as a mishap? Oh, my word, God is saying. Look what's happened on earth. How did that happen? No, not at all. Not at all. We find Jesus turning up in the most unexpected places. Don't you dare, people, think for a moment that God is distant and disinterested in our plight. He is not. He is where He has always been. He is Jehovah Shammah, and He is right there, doing what He has always done, fulfilling His purpose. And only God can determine that purpose because He is God and we are not. So He will use the strangest means. He can even use Satan to do this and we will pray against Him indeed. But at the same time as, as God doing and fulfilling His purpose through that which He has allowed, we see at the same time God weeping for every person that dies, for every fatherless home, for every, every mother that is taken, for every grand that goes out of grandfather that leaves because of this virus, God weeps along with the parents and the children and, and the people. Every time somebody suffers, God suffers alongside with them. He's not a God who is untouched by our infirmities. You don't want to know where God is. He's right there. He's walking beside these people. But here's the interesting thing. He expects us to do the walking on His behalf sometimes. God wants to go and He wants to touch people. He's going to use us to do that. God wants us to go out and care people because that's what He would like to do. And He will use us. God always uses people. 
And so for us as a church and for the church united and the church around the world, this is a great place for us to be right now, fulfilling the purpose of God, weeping for people, touching the people, helping the people, caring for the people, and doing that because God wants us to do that. Where He appears not to be, but is the most unexpected of places. I'm looking forward, at the end of all of this, to hearing some of the stories that come from people. I'm looking forward to hearing stories about people talking about how God protected them. I'm going to celebrate that. That's a great story. I'm going to be looking forward to the stories of how God provided for them in the midst of the crisis and how their faith grew in the midst of the, the trauma and the sadness of what was going on. And they were tested and they passed the test of faith. And God is pleased with them and they will testify of God's amazing provision. I'm looking forward to hearing stories at the end of this whole thing of the providence of God and people recognizing God took me through that because I needed a wake-up call. God was not being mean when He took me through this thing. I needed to wake up before it was too late and restore my life with God. And so we have prayers that are, we'll have testimonies of protection and provision and providence. I'm looking forward to hearing the stories of redemption. Because something like this can turn people to Christ like you can't believe. This might just be the greatest evangelistic tool that God has ever given to the world of turning people's eyes towards God because they can't look anywhere else. And when we look to God, because God knows us and He loves us and He cares for us, and sometimes He has to do this so that we will look to Him with redemption and say, God, redeem my soul, my soul that was desensitized, my soul that was desanitized, my soul that was hard, my soul that was set. God, redeem me. If that is the only purpose for which this virus is here, let me tell you people, it's been worth it. And eternity will testify to that. Can't wait to hear stories. Hmm. Mm. Can't wait for this. Of our church. <sighs> stories that will come from you guys out there of how God has used you at this time to bring a word of encouragement, to bring words of hope, to turn unideal situations into redemptive situations where the gospel is being shared with people. I'm looking forward to that. I think heaven is looking forward in the end to the souls that will be saved as a result of that, which sadly is happening. Let's do one more. Places where He, God, most definitely is. Three places. The first place where God most definitely is, is in you. In you. This is this mystery of what we call being a Christian. We don't understand it. We wish we could explain it, but we can't. Where Christ indwells us. When we give our lives to Christ and we ask for His indwelling presence, presence we, we can't see it, we can't touch it, we, but we know it's to be true. But it's a mystery. How it happens, nobody really knows. But the Scriptures tell us that Christ in you is your only hope of glory. So if you're hoping for glory because of your good works and you're being a nice guy, you're not going to cut it. Christ in you is your only hope of glory in this life and more particularly for the life that is still to come. Christ in you. What about this one? God is in the church. God is in the church, man. This is what makes Satan so nervous, is when a bunch of people to whom God is in get together and we have a body. We don't have a building. We have a body of believers who share the common faith the common ideals, the common passion for the purpose of God. And Satan trembles when people get together like that. If you're on your own, you could find yourself in a little bit of trouble. But uh, when you are together in the body of Christ, you drive Satan crazy. He's frightened of you. The power that is in the body of Christ. I'm intrigued with the story of Gulliver's Travels. I don't know if you've ever read that story. I've done it little research recently about this, this first story. 
of Gulliver who was uh, on a ship and the ship was shipwrecked and he found himself washed up onto a beach. He was unconscious. These little six inch old men find him lying on the beach and they come and they tie him down. And then he wakes up out of his stupor or out of his unconsciousness and he sees himself covered and surrounded by these little men. With great ease, he uses his left hand and he rips up the things that they're tied down and he realizes, I can get out of this. I can get out of this situation with these little men and they're shooting little arrows and he's, and he's de deflecting them. And he realizes, I have the power to get out of this thing, but he allows himself to lie there. In the end, they take him and they, they, they put a, a sleeping sedative in his drink. They take him to a palace. They put him on a thing. They take him there. And he deliberately does nothing with his strength. He could crush those little six-inch men with one hand. He's a giant in compared to him. And the little people are looking at this giant and saying, man, when this sleeping giant arises, we will have a problem. But for them, they had no problem because he was quite enjoying the attention that he was getting as a giant. Let me tell you, people, when the sleeping giant of the church awakens, watch out what happens in the world. It was Napoleon who said of China that they are the sleeping giant. Wait for them to wake up. Although he got the ch right, I don't think he got the Ina part. It shouldn't say China is the sleeping giant. It should be the church is the sleeping giant of this world. When the church wakes up, takes seriously its responsibility as a body of believers to impact the world around us, man, that's going to be a great day. That's going to be a great day. The church is the sleeping giant. And maybe, just maybe, this awful virus could just be the wake-up call for the church. I don't know. Only time will tell. The last place where God most definitely is, is in heaven. In the last verse of this beautiful story of Ezekiel, we read Ezekiel's final focus here. And the name of the city, he's described the dimensions and the size of the city. He's described where the gates are of the city. He's described who's going to be there, who's going to be responsible there. And then he says this, And the name of the city from that time on will be Jehovah Shema. That's the Hebrew. The Lord is there. Can I close today, folks, by turning your thoughts to another Jerusalem? There are so many parallels between Ezekiel's Jerusalem and the Jerusalem that we read of in, in Revelation chapter 21, beautiful picture of heaven. And if we do not experience God in all the ways that we hope down here, but we make it to heaven, we will experience the wonder and the reality of God who is most definitely there. In light of the city that uh, Ezekiel wrote about, there is a parallel of the new Jerusalem. He spoke of the old one of Zion. This is the new Jerusalem. It says very beautiful stuff. Then I saw the new heaven and the new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city. I saw the, the new Jerusalem. This is a picture of heaven. Coming out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Men, are we looking forward to this? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. <sighs> no more mourning. No more coronavirus or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Come, let's pray.
God, it's a good question. Where are you at a time like this? We know where you are not. We've spoken about that right now. We know, Lord, where you are wanting to be, but we know where you most definitely have gone. We know where you appear to be, but you are not. Lord, we know you're not in the place of dry religion, dead faith. You're not in the place of blind presumption where it was good yesterday. doesn't mean that it's going to be good today. God, we know that there are places where you appear to be, but, but appear not to be, but, but you are. And it's incredible, Lord, how you, you turn up in the most unexpected of places. Who would expect you to turn up in a cradle at Christmas time? Who would expect you to do that? Who would expect you, God, to be here on a, on a cross? That's worse than the cradle. But God, you have a track record of turning up in the most unexpected of places. You turn up amongst the poor and the rejected. You turn up amongst those who are not expecting you to turn up at all in fires. In the midst of big storms, you turn up. We're not expecting you there because our eyes are on the storm. But if we could just see you in the midst of the storm of the fire and realize that God is in the place of the unexpected. Lord, we're so thankful that you are not just in these places, but you're also in, the, in us. That you in us, that mystical union that happens when we invite you to come into our lives and, and to occupy all the space in us. And this mysterious union takes place between my spirit and your spirit. I can't explain it. I, I don't understand it. But your word teaches it to be just so true. Thank you, God, today that you're, you're in the church across the world, the sleeping giant. If the sleeping giant of this world is not China, it's the church. Oh, Lord, I pray that just maybe you would hear the prayer of our little church here. And hear of the words of this pastor who's desperate to see a move of God. That you would breathe your spirit into your church afresh that you would pour out new wine, that we wouldn't just have the party, but we would have the party with the wine, and that's going to make all of the difference. And then, Lord, we thank you that you are most definitely in heaven. Our minds cannot fathom what that looks like. We can only imagine. But thank you that you are there. And you await our arrival, whatever that happens, however that happens. We're not afraid of that. We look forward to stepping across the bar into the wonder of this place that you have created that is beautiful in every way. But even if it is beautiful in every way and it doesn't have you, we will not be satisfied. We don't actually care what it looks like as long as you are there. Thank you Whew, that you're in that place. Lord, we trust ourselves to you now and ask your blessing upon us in Jesus' name. Amen.